I really think men is supposed to cry. Like, I don't like, I don't like that. Like, oh, I don't, you don't cry or you got to be tough. I don't like that. Like, no, if you, if you cry, if a man cry to me, I think that's normal. Today, I have a special guest and you know, I always say I'm excited about my guests. And I am. <laughs> this one right here. Okay. We have so much in common. Remember the Bobby and Whitney song? We got some. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we have so much in common. Uh, sh she's a podcaster. She's a YouTuber. She's a mom. Uh, there's so much we're going to discuss. She's a content creator. She's an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, her mm -hmm. testimony is phenomenal. She's from the 216, if you don't know. Definitely. Definitely. That's yeah. Kingdom, Ohio. <laughs> Stand yeah. up, Brave Hearts <laughs> community. Let's show some love to Dashia. How you doing this evening? I'm good. You know, glad to be here. I appreciate you for invite inviting me on your show, on your podcast, your YouTube. That was a um, that was a plus. I appreciate it. I feel special. <laughs> it, but you are special. But but I'm an open book, y'all. So whatever he asks me, I'm telling it all, and I I do not hold back at all. So. Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Well, that's that's a blessing because uh, we want to help somebody, somebody who's watching and somebody uh, watching or who's listening. You just never know what people are going through. So it's really all about building people up and giving them something that they some tools that they can walk away with, uh, especially through some of the things that you've been through and stuff like that. So I know you'll be able to help some people today. Let's jump into today's segment now. Uh, you relocated from Cleveland from to Cleveland, North yes. Carolina. Yes. Yes. What was that transition like for you? Well, first of all, why did you leave? Uh, and it's, it's like kind of like a two-part question. And okay. then eventually tell me, like, what is the dating scene like out there in North Carolina? But uh, what made you leave Cleveland? Okay. So what made me leave Cleveland is you ever felt like, I know a lot of people probably can relate, but if you ever felt like you outgrew something and then it's like I endured so much trauma in Cleveland as I got older, I felt like I needed new. I felt like I wasn't growing. I was a flower, but I wasn't blossoming. So it was just like I was stuck. And I knew in order to make it to the next level, I had to get out. So what I was doing was I was flying to other states like Atlanta, um, Miami. I was going to like different conferences in other states. And then I came out here just to visit. I just came to Charlotte just to visit, but Charlotte felt like home. Like every time I came here, I'm like, this is like home. I can be here. Like when I went to Atlanta and stuff, it wasn't like, it was like, all right, it's cool, but it's not home. So when I came to Charlotte, I'm like, this is home. But when I start having to reach out for, uh, reach out in other states for resources, I felt like it was time to leave home. So I'm like, well, if I'm, I'm going to other states for resources, I probably should take that leap and see see how I can block them. I was like a flower that really wasn't growing. I wasn't blossoming, but I knew I have a lot to offer, but I wasn't growing. I was stuck. I started feeling depressed. I started feeling like I wasn't moving. Like it was just a lot going on. I feel like I was in a dark place in Cleveland. And I'm like, yeah, it's time to go. And then I talked to my dad because he left Cleveland maybe like five years ago. And I talked to my dad. He said he felt the same way right before he left. I'm like, okay, so maybe that's my time to get out. And I'm not saying it's like, I'm, not, I'm from Cleveland. That's my city. But it's more opportunities in other places. So me personally, I had to get out of there to find out who I was and find out what was my next level, meet new opportunities, meet new people. So I had I just had to get out of there. I wasn't blocking in there. So that's why I left Cleveland. Mm, yeah, because you talked about some of that on your podcast that uh, I appreciate that transparency where you talked about that. And, and, and I feel you because I feel, and again, we represent right but yeah. i felt like my life really transitioned when i left cleveland mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and i ended up moving to arizona uh you know with my ex-wife at the time but leaving from cleveland to to arizona i was just like it just felt so different yeah. like i said the opportunities yeah. and everything yeah. right yeah the opportunity the people it's just different like 
the hospitality down here is different. I'm like, you walk up to me, it's kind of scary how nice they is. Like, oh, you go through the, you ain't got an attitude? I'm like, okay. Like, all right, hey, girl. But it, it's just different. Like, it's just so different. And it's very uncomfortable. I'm not telling nobody that it's just the easiest thing I ever done because it's not. It's uncomfortable, but it's a good uncomfortable because it pushes you to do what you have to do. Like, you can't really slack when you're in a new state by yourself. So it's like, you got to do what you got to do. You got to put the work in. And you got to, and for a minute, I kept going back home because I was so uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do. So I kept going back home, like just driving back home. But eventually I'm like, no, you got to stay until you get comfortable here. And then you go back home and visit or whatever you got to do. So, but it's very uncomfortable, but it's a good uncomfortable. So. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and yeah. my sister, my sister lives in North Carolina. My older really? sister. Yeah. Really? I have an older sister. Yeah. Uh, I know, you know, my little sister. But I have an older sister that left. I okay. forgot where what part of North Carolina she's in. Yeah, but she's there. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. How she like it down here? Uh, she loves it. She's been living there for. She's been living in North Carolina for some years now. So she loves it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, a week ago, my wife and I went to uh, shoot this video for on YouTube for this Black Marriage Masterclass, and we were in South Carolina. Okay, okay, okay. And I heard good. South Carolina a little slower, but yeah, I haven't been in North Carolina yet, but really, I haven't been there yet. I'm gonna have to come check it out. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah. nice. It's nice, but it, I, you know, you, what I gotta get used to, like, it takes like 30 minutes to get everywhere. Like, and the driving is crazy. They drive crazy out here. I'm like, yeah, I'm not used to this. <laughs> but yeah. Well, it's the same way oh. in Texas. I'm out here in Texas, okay. so it's the same thing. Thirty minutes everywhere okay. you go. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. You like it out there though? Yes, I love it here okay. in Texas. Yeah, I met some okay. phenomenal people here. Okay. Uh, and 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 now that you're in North Carolina, what's the dating scene like? Is it different? You know what? I have a fiance, so I don't know. Okay. So I don't know, but it's funny because you know when you like on like TikTok and stuff like that. But I don't I don't know if it's the people who already is from here who's saying it, but they just say it's a crazy dating scene here. But I don't everybody I haven't yet to meet somebody who said they're from Charlotte here. Mm -hmm. Everybody is from everywhere else. So I I don't I like that part I don't know. I'm gonna be honest. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. part I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, for sure. So uh fiance. So yeah. When when are we expecting some some wedding bells? You know what, to be honest. We haven't even planned it yet. Life, life been going on um, from moving to Cleveland to trying to put, um, find my son like ABA therapy and put him back in school and get everything together. Plus, I was back and forth on the road a lot back to Cleveland because I had to finish my last semester of school. Um, I graduated December of last year, so I had to. Yeah, thank you. So I had to do that, and then it's just been a lot. So we haven't even planned that part yet. I'm gonna be honest. I haven't got, <laughs> haven't even got to that yet. <laughs> no, it's, so. It's, it's all good. No, it's all good. Well, congratulations to that, and congratulations to uh, graduating as well. Because oh, I you. see you, you all about making things happen. Uh, let's talk about your your weight loss journey. This is something else that we have in common because I myself was almost three hundred pounds, and I got down to I'm not, I'm like one ninety five, one ninety eight, depending on how many okay. donuts I eat. Mm, it depends. Okay. Yeah. Oh, trust me, I know the feeling. I need about 12 <laughs> cupcakes in one sitting. People be looking at me. Yeah, I can. Y'all don't know me. I still got a fat, I got a fat brain. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where it started, so right? It started up here. Yep, yep, yep. So my weight loss journey is a little different because what made me start losing weight is what I was diagnosed with like infertility when I was like 21. So a lot of doctors... I was diagnosed with infertility, um, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome when you got uh, cysts on your ovaries. So I was diagnosed with that. I was only like 21. I think this doctor tried to give me um, in vitro, I want to say. She tried to like give me in vitro. She tried to put me on all these meds and all type of stuff. But I was just like, I kind of was like aware. I was a aware 21 year old. I wasn't like, you know, immature. So I was like, this can't be right that I got to do all this and I'm only 21 and then my mother has 12 kids. You're not about to tell me my mother has 12 kids and I'm just the one who can't have kids. It just didn't make sense to me. So I was like, no, let me just try to lose weight first and let's see what that do for me. And I was up at university on, um, what is that, Richmond? Mm -hmm. up, there, by, up there right across the street from Lifetime Gym. So I went 
to as soon as I left her office, I went to Lifetime to sign up for the gym. And I literally just started. No trainer, no nothing. I went in the gym, I signed up, and I was there the next day. I dropped like 20 pounds. Once I saw the 20 pounds gone, it was over with. It was like 20 again, 20 again. Then I'm down 80. Then I'm down 100. So, and then also, soon as I hit like, I think like under 200 pounds, like my cycles came back normal. Like, and then I had my son once I hit like 160 or something like that. So even a doctor couldn't believe it when I got pregnant. Like she was like, you made it bad for a lot of patients. I'm like, yeah, because their weight probably is hindering them. So that's how I lost a lot of my weight. That's what started my weight loss journey. And that's what got me on the go. So till this day, I'm still on my weight loss journey. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a journey. It's a lifestyle. You got to really want it. You really got to change your mental to really lose weight. Like it's not nothing that's easy. Like I want to drop five pounds this week. It's a lifestyle. You just got to let it flow. Like, and a lot of people don't get that. Mm-hmm. So, so give us some of your, your inside hacks on, on weight loss. Somebody's probably listening or watching. And maybe they're struggling with their weight. Maybe they already lost their New Year's resolution. Mm-hmm. What would be your uh, your your hacks to helping somebody lose weight? So my hack is train your mental first. So make sure you are ready. Ask yourself, like, do you want it? Why are you doing it? Because a lot of people, like, you know, we see stuff, we see stuff, and we get motivated. Like, motivation is cool, but you really need discipline. Like, like kill the motivation and get the discipline and consistency. So try to practice that first and then train your mental to really want it. Like, cause if you don't want it and you only, oh, I want to get ready for summer, I want to get ready for my birthday is you going to, that motivation going to die. And then you going to start all over and you're going to keep hitting rock bottom. So what you got to do is really tell yourself that you want to gain the discipline. I know a lot of people tell they stuff, Oh, I got to work, but you have time. Like you have time. Like, I don't care if you got to get up at five o'clock in the morning, you got to discipline yourself to really want it. Like if you really want it, you'll do it. So I just feel like, Start with that. Start with your mental. Once you get your mental together, get you a little routine. You don't got to go crazy in the gym. Go to, to the gym for 30 minutes a day if you can, three times a week. It, it makes a difference. Like, as long as you're moving, like, it makes a difference. Do some yoga. Um, nutrition. Nutrition is key. You don't have to hardcore work out because you can hardcore work out and eat bad and it's still not going to do nothing. But you can eat right and do minor workouts and you're going to see a lot of results. So, nutrition is key too so i say discipline consistency train your mental to really want it ask yourself why are you doing it do you really want it and then nutrition those are the three biggest things and then i just feel like move your body like i don't care how you're doing it move your body go for a walk do yoga you don't have to hardcore work out like how you see all the fitness influencers and then kill comparison too because a lot of people are like oh i want to look like her you're not going to look like her you're going to look like you so you got to kill the comparison like and i had to learn that too because i'm like oh i want to look like that i want to look like that and all actuality i was 300 pounds i'm only five two i got a lot of new skin I'm not going to look like the influencers who was never my size. I'm going to look like me. So you got to kill the comparison and that's going to help too. like kind of step outside of the internet and then face reality. Like this is who I am and this is how I want to look. So kill the comparison too. And I feel like those are the key things to start in a weight loss journey. I know a lot of people feel like they got to just go crazy in the gym. You don't like go do 30 minutes on the treadmill, put it on a little incline and walk up a hill. Like you gonna see results and just give it time. Don't rush it. Like your body don't change quick. It form, it take like what, 21 days to form a habit. So give yourself time, like trust the process. So mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. the main thing on a fitness journey or a weight loss journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. You got to trust the process because uh, I know we yeah. live in this microwave age where, you know, everything, yeah. you know, you went to the yeah. gym today and you're going to look like Beyonce tomorrow. tomorrow. Yep. Yep. Or you see, and I hate to say this, I'm, I'm not against nothing. If that's what you want to do, get your BBL, get your surgery. I'm not against nothing. But you can't look like if you was like me personally, I was like I say, I was five two, three hundred 300 pounds. I'm not going to look like a girl who got a BBL. I'm I'm never going to look like that. So it's just like, you got to kind of step up, step into reality. And then, but a, a, a nice body can be made in the gym also. So I don't want people to, you know, discard that. Like I, it's some cold bodies in the gym. So it's just like, you, you, you can make a body in the gym. You can do a lot with a body in the gym. Your body going to do what you want it to do. So it's just like, yeah, this new microwave age kind of got to ditch that and really step into reality like this is my lifestyle like this is how I, I want to look like this because I want to look like this or I'm gonna change my body to look like this because I want it to look like this so mm-hmm. yeah now I kind of want to switch gears a little bit um because here's something else we have in common <laughs> we both have have kids with autism or at least I have two boys with autism okay. 
Um, so what was that journey like for you? And uh, what is your mental process with that now? Like, how do you process things now? Do you look at uh, autism as more of a challenge or do you look at it as something that like this is where my son is this is the way things are supposed to be you know like what was your mental process with the whole uh, autism so for you i kind of i kind of already knew so like you you know when you like and i don't compare nothing but you know i like i was like oh he don't do this he don't do that so like he was impeccable with climbing walking um mobile anything like the, the mobile the motor skills yeah. impeccable but he wasn't talking he wouldn't say nothing he really wasn't paying attention to me and this was early this maybe was like eight months but his pediatrician red flagged it but i'm like we're not gonna red flag it that early because you know but she was she was real kind of like i like her because she was real cautious with her job she really paid attention to everything so i like that but i'm like no we're gonna let him grow some more so you know mm -hmm. i kept up i kept up with um all his doctor's appointments everything but he still wasn't like talking when he really didn't pay attention to nothing he didn't play with other kids and stuff like that so i'm like okay mm -hmm. so she you know she sent me to the developmental pediatrician and then we got his diagnosis and it was funny because once i got the diagnosis to be honest it was a relief because it was like now i can take the next step mm -hmm. so it, i wasn't disappointed or nothing because i'm like okay early intervention is better we don't you know you don't never know how autism end up like they end up talking and they end up being you know lower on the spectrum so it's like you never know like it's not a super bad thing only thing I feel some type of way about is because we don't know what's causing it and I just feel like too many children nowadays are being diagnosed with autism and that's not normal that's the only thing I feel some type of way about about my son being diagnosed with it I'm not because I feel like God put him in my God gave me him for a purpose because he know that I'm gonna stand 10 toes down and gonna figure it out and I know that a lot of people get frustrated, don't know what to do, but it's like, I'm a voice. So it's like, he was gave to me to be the voice. Like, I'm I'm going to stand up for them regardless. So it's like, I was put, he was put for me to be a voice. And that's why I started the Ramon Will Speak movement. And it just made me look at not even autism, but special needs, totally different. Like, it just, even for the parents, like, it's, it's different. It's a lot. It's not hard, but it, it's definitely challenging because it's not like, I can't tell him, like, go get this for me or go grab that for me or do this or I can't just drop him off at a regular preschool and be like, all right, he, he going to school today. It's, it's not that easy. So it's a little more work as a parent. So that's the only challenge I feel like it is. But as far as like him him having it, I feel like he was gave it to me for a reason. I'm here to be the voice of these kids and I'm going to be the voice. And I'm like, I'm, it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help them some type of way. Like I got to have some type of foundation, some type of, like, I don't know if it's going to be an autism daycare that I want, something like that, because I know how to treat them, because I know I have an autistic child. And, you know, a lot of people don't have a patience, don't know what to do, but I got it. So I know I would treat somebody else autistic here like my own, because I understand you, because I deal with this on a daily, and I really understand you. And a lot of stuff they do don't make me mad, because I understand y'all. I understand when you overstimulate it. I understand when you're just flipping out for no reason. I understand that you can't tell me what you want, so I got to go to extra steps to figure it out. So it's like, I understand it, and I want to help. And I want to help other parents who don't have the help and need the help, and I can be there, like, you know, some type of way, be there to help the next parent. Because I know a lot of parents are frustrated and don't have the mental I have and don't know how to process their child having autism, but it don't bother me. I'm strong-minded. Like, I'm really, like, a real-life soldier. So it's like, it don't bother me. Yeah. That's what's up. Now with with patience, because I I totally relate to everything you're saying, because like I said, I have two boys. And what really helps me with that is my wife work with autistic kids. Okay. okay. So she, so she kind of have the inside track opposed to me not having it. Right. So right. I have to learn a little more patience. So with you, did you feel like the patience was something that you already had or was it something that I kind of had to. Okay. Oh, I, ain't, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay. It, it, I think I kind. I feel like I already had it, but it grew more as he got older. Because you know, like as a baby, they don't do much. Like it's not much that you notice because they're babies. 
Now, as he got older and he started being a little more like pushy, like he'll push you when he want to push you to something or he'll just shove something in your face or something like that. I had to no patience. Like he don't get it. Like, you know what I'm saying? He don't really comprehend like a regular kid. So I got to sit here and figure it out. Like sometimes when he cries, I just sit and look at him until he calmed down, like into like, okay, I got to figure out what he wants. So it's just like a lot of patience. And then it's like, you can't hurt them. They don't know. Like they really don't know. Like they just the most precious people I've ever seen. And they so smart. So it's just like, just figure it out. Like you kind of just got to, I learned to like, just let him, sometimes I let him cry it out. Like sometimes you got to cry it out and then come back and see if you can just release and tell me because sometimes you can't figure it out like with them without them talking sometimes you can't figure it out and they do get frustrating but i just i just let them do his thing cry it out whatever you're gonna do and you will figure it out you will come back later because you're gonna need me so you will come back later and tell me what you want so it's a lot of patience grew over time and as he get older he kind of getting a little more aggressive so i really gotta have patience like he like pushy like if he don't get it wrong like i said like he'll walk up to me and push me not, not a regular person and be like, you ain't about to push me, but it don't bother me because I know that's his only form of communication. He got to push me to let me know he mad. Now I know you mad. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not really aggressive to me. It's like something that I know that he trying to express himself. So I kind of let him express himself because that's the only way he know how he can't say it in words. So he got to say it, you know, with his hands or something like that. So I, I learned to like, you know, let him express himself or have patience with him when he's doing certain stuff. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I understand because my I have a two year old and a four year old that they both have it, and the four year old is coming along really well. And we was more concerned okay. about him than anything. But my okay. two year old, he's nonverbal, and okay. he he does the hitting to get that attention. Yep. Yep. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So we have to learn that patience and help him with trying to breathe and stuff like that, and just trying to get him mm-hmm. to be calm. So. Yep. Uh, and, and not that I think about this because there's a lot of things that my wife is showing me with that, with the boys, because this is new for me. So how how does that work? How does that dynamic work with your fiance and, and the autism? Like, how, how does he fit into the mix with that? So he watched me do a lot of stuff. So, like, sometimes he, you know, I'm with him more, like, because he usually be out working and stuff like that. So I'm with my son more, but he'll ask me, like sometimes he asks me, like, do you know what it is that he, can you tell me what he wants? Or, and I'll let him know, like when he do this, he wants that. Or if he, I don't know if your son do it, but he tense up real hard when he excited or something. Mm-hmm. Like he tense up and I'm like, he excited. It's something that he like, whatever you're doing, he like it. So I'll be having to kind of express to him his signs. Like, and then he learned a little stuff like, when he do this, he want to eat. Like, so I'm like, you know, he want, he want, he wants some food. Like, so little stuff that he do, I try to express it to him like this, what this means. So even when I'm not around, you know what he's doing. Like, so you could know what he want. Like if he push you, he pushing you just stand up because he's going to push you to whatever he wants. So just stand up and let him push you and, you know, get around. But he's real patient with him too. Now, sometimes when he whining a lot, he kind of like, I'm like, but you got to be patient and let him whine because he cannot express himself. So he got to cry. So you got to let him, but for the most part, he do good with him too. Now, sometimes, like I said, I have to tell him like what certain stuff mean, but he he know now. He know a lot about him now. Now that I tell him like this mean this, this mean that he wants you to get up. He wants you to do this. So it's he he doing good with him now. Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome. Because that I think that's something that we don't discuss enough. Um, as single, you mm-hmm. know, as a single parent, or if you're in into a blended family, and how does that dynamic work? with having a child with autism and, and getting you into the mix and getting them acclimated to the way things work. Um, so I think that's a conversation that we don't have enough of. Yeah. I would yeah. say personally, or maybe I'm just not, and maybe I haven't just found the community yet. I don't know, but it might, know. It, it might be, it's probably the community. Cause even when he around, like when I take him out my grandma house or something like that, I still got to like explain to him, like, I mean, explain to them like what to do, like get him his, like, it's almost kind of like having a baby. Cause I'm like, give him some milk every three hours, leave his chips out. You know what I'm saying? Like I got to tell them everything to do because he can't tell them like, and he have a schedule and you know, they not good with change. So like he need his milk in his cup. Like he want his chips in the blue bag. So you know what I'm saying? So you got to kind of express that to them. So it is kind of hard to, I mean, hard to, yeah, you probably just haven't found the community for it yet. Cause I don't think I have either. Cause I got to kind of express to everybody like what's going on. Like even when we in the store, the lady asked me one day, like I kind of like had that. She asked me one day, like, why are you making that noise? I'm like, why are you asking me that? 
Like, I, you know, I'm starting to learn not to get so offensive because people don't know, but I just feel like it's a better way, you know, to ask people questions instead of the stuff, like why, in the way she said it, like why he making that noise? And I'm, you know what, I said, I'm learning to just be like, I'm, I'm, I'm so tired of, oh, he autistic. Like, I don't like having to keep saying it. Like, I really don't like to keep saying it because one thing about me, I do not glorify autism because it's just like, I'm going to get to the bottom of it. I'm going to get to the bottom of where, where autism is coming from because ain't no way that all these kids are autistic. It's too many autistic kids. Like, I could see if it was just a few and it just, you know, like, it's too many. It's like every other kid is being diagnosed with autism. Like, where is it coming from? And, like, nobody in my family has it ever. He was the first one. So, like, where is it coming from? So, it's just like, I'm not glorifying it, but I I I stand with it because we gonna beat it. And I like I always say, like I'm gonna heal my son. Like I'm gonna make sure my son talks before I leave this earth. So no, that's right. I'm I'm gonna do it, but it's like I don't like the glorifying and the movement. Like the move, like it's cool to you know support autistic kids, but some people if they they looking at it like it's like a a sport or something like autism ain't no sport. Like we really like parents. We we some of us over here fighting for our lives and y'all think y'all could just march for autism like no it's not like that like y'all we we fighting we fighting hard like y'all got two-year-olds that can talk to y'all and express it to y'all and we going the extra miles doing extra stuff and can't get certain stuff done so it's just like a lot of stuff i don't respect on the internet and i don't reshare it so mm -hmm. yeah but. no i respect that because there are there uh there's so much that that goes with it with uh just the parenting peace you know it's just so mm -hmm. much that go into it yeah. and then trying to learn and like you said with autism there's so because i'm still learning right so yep. to those who are yep. listening or those who watch and comment in the comment section below uh if you know anything about autism or share your story with us in the comment section below we'd love to hear from you but mm -hmm. um oh i lost my train of thought where was i going with that uh oh i was saying too that i know for my boys because my biggest concern is when they get older you know I want to make sure that they're good. Like they can advocate for, sure. for themselves. For sure. For you know sure. So and, and sometimes I just get on TikTok and watch like um like autistic kids when they turn like 18. Like I watch this, I follow this one girl, she got autistic, she in college, but it's funny to see it because she reminds me of my son because she get overstimulated. She not good with change. She don't like to be around people. I'm like, this this 18 year old is in college and she autistic, but I know she's probably smart as heck. Like I'm like, this is crazy. Like but it's 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 amazing to see it to me now. Like I wasn't really aware of autism before my son had it. Like I heard about it. You know, you hear about stuff, but until it happened to you, you really dig into it. And then I really dug into it, and it was like, okay, I see, I see that they are so smart. That's one thing for sure. Like he got a photogenic memory. Like I don't care where we at, he can pull up. Like if we in Cleveland, he could pull up their freeways. If we in Charlotte, he pull up their freeways. When we in Miami, he pull up their freeways. Like he know how to pull up their freeways. He on the floor. So they are very smart. Yeah. They are. They really are smart. And uh, I know for like for my boys, uh, like you said, with your son being the first to be diagnosed, uh, same thing with with my boys. Wow. You know, I'm just like, where's this coming from? You know, what I'm saying? Yeah. and then with my sister and, 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 you know, and my nephew and I'm just like, like, where's all this coming Where's from? It coming strange from? with the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're the first mm -hmm. in our family to we don't yeah. have a a line of of uh autism but yeah until i dug deep and i started digging deep like they tried to do tests on him and stuff i said oh no i refused everything i went and did my own research and found out that it was environmental and that's what really kind of threw me for a loop too because when i found when i found out it was environmental it kind of made me question the doctors because the doctors were telling me like oh we can test you and tell you if your next kid will be autistic but how can y'all do this it's just an environmental disorder and not a genetic disorder so I dig deep like that's when I say I'm gonna heal my son I'm gonna heal him and I mean that like I be digging for herbs and everything but he don't eat so it's hard to kind of give him certain stuff like he eat three things that's it mm -hmm. and it's not real food so yeah it's 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 a struggle I get it because my boys they <laughs> picky when it comes to their food they so picky I'm just like yes. Oh my God, you know, so I, I feel you. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I want to make make sure that uh, this video is being shared because uh, you speak in life, and I want to play this video back when you come up with something that's going to create some change. Mm -hmm. so, uh, mm -hmm. I can say she Definitely. said it on my show first. 
Definitely. No, for real. I, I'm going to figure it out. Like, I'll be watching shows on Dr. Sebi, because you know Dr. Sebi talk about autism. He talk about the heavy metals on the brain and stuff like that. So I'm like, I'm going to dig into it. I'm, I'm going to figure it out. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I see it in your eyes. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, what do you think is the biggest mistake you see women make in relationships? Not thinking about the man's mental. You kind of put it on a back burner a little bit. I don't know. I feel like, I don't know if I want to say all women, mm -hmm. but I know, I feel like me, that was a big mistake. I, and I kind of feel like it's a lot of us, like not thinking about the man. Man, So, you know, we was raised to feel like, like the man is strong, the man the arm, the man the backbone, but it's just like, they need us too. They need, they need a place to be soft and not have to be so hard in the family man and not show no emotion and stuff like that. So I feel like the mental, mm. like you gotta let that man open up or have a vulnerable place to open up and not always be strong and feel like just the backbone of the family. Cause that's how a lot of black men were raised, which is nothing wrong with it, but now they so strong minded and feel like they can't cry or do something like, I don't like that. Mm. So yeah. I feel like that was a big issue. Mm. Yeah, and, and it was just in your opinion and, and what you see. Maybe it might have been some of your girlfriends or some of the you know women you know uh, always ask that question because when men are on the show, I ask men, "What do you think is the biggest mistake men make?" You know, so right, right, yeah, right. Because you know? I had one of my guests on. She's like, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this is about women." I said, "No." I said, I said, "I'm an equal opportunity employer. Everybody, can right, right, yes." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I think that's what it is. Like black men is really like kind of raised to be or was already like the backbone of the family and had to go out there and be strong and make the money. And like and we don't know that they suffer a lot of trauma out there or just from having to take care of the, the burden. It, it might not even be a real burden, but in all actuality, it's to a certain extent, I feel like it is. And they don't really have a a, a place to be soft like I know everybody always talking about soft girl but men need a place to be soft too and not always hard and strong and you know the backbone of the family need a place to be vulnerable so 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 if your fiance came to you in the in this in this uh sensitive state you're not gonna look at him sideways I'm not gonna look at him out he hard so I if he come to me since I know something wrong <laughs> I I know something majorly wrong because he is the a like he is like a hammer like you can't break him. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. Like if he comes to me soft, like I really think men is supposed to cry. Like I don't like I don't like that. Like oh, I don't you don't cry or you got to be tough. I don't like that. Like no, if you if you cry if a man cry to me, I think that's normal. Mm -hmm. I don't that's look at it as soft or nothing like that. That's interesting I, because, and I, I don't hear that a lot. Um, yes, I, I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, or especially like with women, it's like, oh, I kind of look at him sideways if he's crying because if mm -hmm. he's if he's crying, then what am I supposed to do? Mm -mm. That's see that that's not good though, because then they feel like they got to be hard, and then what if they do get to the put. A place where they want to break and then suicide is big. You don't never know what nobody thinks. Somebody could be like, oh, I don't think about suicide. You don't know what people are thinking about. They're not going to just, some people won't even tell you it. They uh, think about it and just fight it and get over it. So you got to give people a space to be soft. And just because it's a, just because, just because it's a man don't mean nothing. This man could probably, this man probably could fight whatever you want to call it. But if he break down, I just feel like that's normal. Like that, that is normal. Being strong is traumatizing. Like, all the time, 24-7, just having to be strong at every point in your life or can't cry around a woman that you really love who is in that space, like, you should be able to cry around a female that you really love. Like, she should be able to see your soft spot. Now, I could see in a dating stage or something like that, all right, be a little tough, you know, put your shield on. Behind closed doors, when you with your woman that you finally meet or marry or engage to, you should be able to be soft to that woman. And then I feel like if you can't be soft to her, that's not normal. I love so. that. That's 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 good. I, I appreciate that because a lot of times, uh, men. I think one thing that might be a misconception about us is we are always in protection mode. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, if I have a family or, you know, my mom or sister, like I have to be the first line of defense. Yep. Yep. You know, so. Uh, and think about how traumatizing that could be to a man. Though. After even if you front line and have to go to defense and then you they, you in a relation, now you go to defense in the front line for your family. Like you tough. But I'm sure you got a soft spot where you want to break down, but you feel like you can't because you don't want nobody to think you soft. Like, no, I'll break down. You're going to feel better. Break down in front of me. I want to mm -hmm. see you cry. Like, yes, that's normal to me. Like, that's mm -hmm. normal. And as I'm, and I think I'm learning that because I know that I need a healing and I know how I feel. So I feel like if I need this and I'm a female, imagine how a man feels, a real man. Like, I'm a female. So imagine how a man feels who's been fighting for his life or had to be in the streets or had to be front line, like you say, like in defense and finally grow up and find like they need a lot of men need healing too so it's just like you got to see how we are as females and we need healing we need therapy they do too like men do too so mm -hmm. i think that's why i look at it like that mm -hmm. yeah i love that um yeah i think yeah that's i think that's, that's gonna be the, the first clip i share from this video and it's actually <laughs> that's good people need to hear that you, you end up setting a lot of men free because um, I think I think I think we need that, uh, especially for black men and all the stuff that definitely, we endure, you know, definitely, yeah. Um, and and shout and shout out to you too for for. I'll, I'll talk to you about that off camera or whatever. I'll talk to you. Okay. About that. <laughs> okay. This, this would be that'd be an un, uncut version of something. I'll, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I was gonna say if I say you know what, um, okay. <laughs> Next question. From seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? Didn't know nothing about it. Okay. Look, my father went to prison. He was in federal prison when I was like three days old. And my mother was on drugs. So I was raised by my grandmother and my grandfather, but they were married. But, you know, that didn't register in my head because them wasn't my parents. You know what I'm saying? So that really didn't. It didn't do nothing uh, like, oh, marriage, marriage, marriage. It really didn't do nothing to me. It was like, it, I didn't feel nothing from that. So I grew up basically, you know, with my grandmother. So it was like, I didn't, I knew, I was a mature teenager. So it's like, I knew what my life was. I knew what I was capable of. I knew what I wanted. I just had to work towards it. I had a lot of obstacles to get past to get to where I'm at, but it's just like, I wouldn't trade him for nothing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade my mother for nothing. I wouldn't trade my father for nothing. I appreciate the trauma like I do because I don't think I would work as hard as I do today if I didn't have a trauma. I probably wouldn't have got to the next level if I didn't have a trauma. I feel like the trauma made me a, made me a hard worker, a fighter. Like it just, it, it, it turned me up. So it's just like, I wouldn't trade it. But as far as marriage, it didn't, they didn't teach me nothing. Like I had a drug addict as a mother and a criminal as a father. So it's just like, I see the street. Mm -hmm. So well, it, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, you know, and, and again, these are just questions based off of your experience. So no, I appreciate that. Appreciate you sharing that. Um, last question before we go. Uh, and this is just in your opinion. Okay. Do you find it easier to love yourself or is it easier to love someone else? Now, I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share two point of views real quick. Before, when I was bigger, it was easier to love somebody else. When I lost weight and gained confidence and really healed myself and started going through like a soul therapy and a, a hard self care to figure out who I was, it's easier to love myself now. So when my confidence was low, when I was bigger, I didn't really try to heal myself. Um, I didn't really keep myself up. It was easier to love somebody else. It felt better to love somebody else to show a lot of love to somebody else. Now, it feels better to love me because I'm healing myself. Um, I'm doing hard self-care on myself. I'm talking about mentally, the discipline, the the lifestyle. Um, now that I got the confidence and I know who I am, it's a lot easier to love myself. It's almost like overly love. So now, so. Ooh, that's a whole show within itself. It is. Put me back on here, okay? Okay, okay, yeah, I was about to say. So, Brave Arts community, you heard it here. So, 
I'm going to make sure that I bring Dashia back on because there's so much stuff that I have to ask her more because she's dropping <laughs> gems. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. This has been a phenomenal episode. Um, well, first of all, I want to acknowledge you for um, having the the courage to uh, take that step in your health and to take care of yourself and to prioritize you. I know that can be challenging for a lot of women at times because you're always taking care of other people. Yeah. Um, so to put yourself first, I want to acknowledge you for that. And uh, parenting, you know, Parenting, uh, child with autism, and making sure that you're putting him in the best situation to win. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge you for that thing. And for also just stepping out in faith and your podcast and, and your YouTube channel. I, I was listening to the podcast the other day at work. Um, and I was just Thank like, you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I said, okay, she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, I want to acknowledge you for those things. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Well, you can reach me on Instagram. My Instagram name is underscore D-A-S-H-E-A. -E I'm on Facebook under my name, Dashia Ford, D-A-S-H-E-A-F-O-R-D. -E and I'm on Twitter as she in law Two. S-H-E-I-N-L-A-W with the number two. So that's how you can reach me on those three platforms. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, Brave Hearts community, you heard it here. Make sure you go connect with Dashia because she has amazing content. She's inspirational. Uh, and she's going to keep it 100 with you, as you can see from this episode. <laughs> if you are watching this, make sure you hit the subscribe button and share this with someone because you never know what someone is going through after watching this video. I've realized over time, it's all about getting your videos and people group chats. If you mm -hmm. get your video and people mm -hmm. group chats, you win it. You win it. That's <laughs> you how you get them numbers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, make sure you do that. So hit the subscribe button, share this in your group chat. Also, if you are listening to this via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review. Would love for you to do that. Leave me an honest rating and review by doing so that put you in a, uh, in a um, put you in a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free things? So this has been another episode. This is Sean Heineman with special guests. That's your voice. <laughs> All right, Brave Arts community, take care.